Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So those of you who are coming in, if you can just be considerate and tiptoe. In the tradition of our community-based project work, it's a, a real honor to introduce Brian Bell. I'm going to be very brief, very brief, because uh, our time is limited and he's got to get back. Uh, Brian Bell is the uh, founder and executive director of Design Corps. Um, that organization has been in existence for about uh, 10 years, and it has a fellows program that's uh, very exciting, and I'm sure he's going to talk to you about that. And he is the author of Good Deeds, Good Design, Community Service Through Architecture, which really features not only the work that they do, but good practices, best practices throughout the United States and the world. And uh, it's, it's, it's a book that I use for my uh, text last spring in our design build efforts and it's uh, it's really an honor to have him here today so with no further ado Brian Bell thank you I'm very sorry I was late I was sitting in LaGuardia for two hours um, it's a pleasure to be here. Tim, thanks for all your work in getting me here. And to, this afternoon, I'd like to talk about a change happening in the design field. And if you guys heard Cameron last year, you have a little idea about what I'm going to talk about. But the main thing I want to say is this is a change that's being initiated by your generation, not by Cameron, not by me. And uh, one, one recent example of that is we're having a conference at Harvard, which is certainly the sort of mainstream uh, of architectural education. And what they wanted to call the conference was student-initiated social justice projects because our faculty don't get it. So <laughs> hopefully that uh, your faculty, well, thanks for including my book in your course, uh, hopefully your faculty is more supportive of this strong interest among your generation. But the change that's happening in the design field is really an expansion, um, an expansion in three different ways. We're serving more clients, we're addressing more issues, and we're providing a greater variety of services. Let me tell a quick story about a woman named Alice Cole that kind of illustrates all of those things. Uh, Alice Cole is a low-income African-American woman living in Bayview, uh, Virginia. Tiny little rural community. She's listening to the radio and she, she heard that they were going to put a maximum security prison right on top of her house, basically. She never heard anything about it. She, you know, she looked outside. <laughs> um, so Alice, who had never been politically active in any way, decided to organize her community and um, they got an environmental justice grant, and then they got social justice grants. They got Maurice Cox from University of Virginia, who designed an entire community for them that is now built. Amazing story about what can design do. Now, you know, there's not a lot to Bayview, but as Alice describes it, that was our community. That was what we had. Um, obviously, a lot of politicians didn't think much about it and were willing to obliterate it. Um, thanks to a designer, Maurice Cox, uh, it's better than ever. But the, the reason I want to tell this story is when I asked Alice, I said, Alice, how do you explain what design does for people when you talk to people in your community? And she said, design is everything around you. And I thought, wow, you know, we, that's the way we need to think. We, we need to think about the great capacity there's so many things that design can do that we're not beginning to think about. I'm going to run through a couple of projects, um, give you a few more illustrations. Um, this is a project, I, we've all thought, well hopefully we've all kind of thought about disaster relief to some degree with the disasters, especially with Katrina, um, but there are no um, ultimate solutions. The creativity is always needed. 
This is a solution for a, a tent, an emergency tent, by a guy named Robert Gillis. It's just a clip. And basically, you can find any uh, compression member and any um, salvage, any kind of sheet material, and make a tent out of it. So you can send in a lot more of these details than trying to send in tents. And when I was working on the Gulf Coast after Katrina, I saw these set up. Um, people had used these as a first response. So it's a detail, it can be disaster relief, you know, extremely creative. But if you have anybody ever tell you that everything's already been thought of and we're just doing it again, run as fast as you can because that's that's exactly the wrong that's exactly the opposite of what I'm telling want to tell you all we we have barely begun to scratch the surface of what design can do for people um, this is this should give you a little bit of ambition this is a, a thesis project by a student at Georgia Tech he did a thesis about connecting some abandoned railway lines around Atlanta and he graduated, took a job with a firm, somewhat bored with his job, and he sent a letter to the city council proposing that they do this project. Um, the city council adopted his proposal. It's now a $7 billion project in Atlanta. Um, this is a group, this is a great group, I don't know if you've heard of Heavy Trash in Los Angeles. They consider themselves guerrilla architects. They install their projects at night. They're totally anonymous. We invited them to speak at one of our conferences. We never could find out who was, they would just say, we'll forward this to the appropriate party. And, and when they spoke, she wore a mask. Um, uh, they actually, their heavy trash name is based on the fact that anything under 2,000 pounds that's not bolted down is considered trash. So they build all these, these objects and install them at night, and since they're not connected, they're just considered trash, so they're not actually breaking the law. But here's one, for example. Um, this is a uh, gated community. So what they did was they built these little uh, observation platforms and stuck them next to gated communities so people could look inside. And actually, in this gated community, this used to be a public street, and they had it dedicated to the private use of the gated community. So it's about public space being you know, privatized. Uh, this was another one. This was a, uh, a homeless park in Los Angeles, and the city put a fence all the way around it so nobody could get in to, to use it. So uh, heavy trash came and uh, built a stairway over the fence one night so people could get back into the park. Um, so what issues? What, you know, we, we have some issues on our plates that we think about, and these are architectural issues. What are the issues that are architectural, that are design issues, that are critical in our society? Um, immigration. You may not think of immigration as an architectural issue. Teddy Cruz has done a project. Um, I heard a guy from the General Services Administration describe um, border crossing stations as a mixture of a toll booth and a jail. I mean, how pathetic. How pathetic is that for you know, how people enter our country? A little, more, um, a little more positive program is proposed by Teddy Cruz. Teddy Cruz, this is actually um, you know, an abstract uh, interpretation, but looking at colonias and the way they use space in a very condensed fashion, uh, Teddy, Teddy uh, proposed a type of bridge going across the border. Um, and it's actually kind of an anti-sprawl use of space as well. So, you know, the U.S. can learn from other cultures as well. Um, he's actually got a proposal where he takes takes this use of space and goes back into a McMansion and reprograms it with all kinds of mixed use um, to make a better use of the space. Uh, this is a project. Uh, we went to a small town in Alabama and we um, basically had a conversation with them about what their critical issues were. They said um, unemployment and child care. 
or unemployment, sorry. And we said, well, okay, that doesn't sound very architectural, but why, why do you have unemployment here? And they said, well, we have an undertrained workforce and we don't have any childcare for the single mothers, so they have to stay at home. Uh, so my wife proposed a project. Uh, she actually started it in Sambo Mockby's uh, studio at Virginia, UVA. So it's a child care job training center to address those two components of their unemployment. So unemployment is an architectural issue. Um, she got a $400,000 HUD grant and uh, it was completed. This is the job training portion. Um, people are going to be building their own homes. Um, it's not habitat because they're actually individually designed homes. But um, uh, so they'll actually be learning the trade uh, construction skills um, while they build their own house. So we define our work as designing for the 98% without architects. In the U.S., only 2% of new home buyers work directly with ar architects. So that, to me, is kind of symbolic. That's what we're doing now, and this is the potential we have that we're not doing, not just in terms of home ownership, in terms of everything. So I'd like, I, I hope that image will stick with you of our unrealized potential as designers. My own, uh, my own career, I went to Yale. I got my dream job with Stephen Hall. After about six months of that, I realized Hey, I realized uh, that wasn't what I wanted to do. I had a sort of midlife crisis six months after I got out of school. And uh, my sister was out in central Pennsylvania working with migrant workers. And, uh, you know, in New York City, you've got a designer every square foot. And, you know, you just uh, somebody once said, you, in New York, your PhDs are designing faucets, whereas in rural America, you have people without any design education or any interest in design or laying out square miles of roads and housing. So I decided that I would uh, leave Stephen's, Stephen's office and go out to um, rural Pennsylvania where there was not a single architect around. thought maybe that would be, maybe I could be more useful. Uh, the first thing I did, which was uh, turned out to be a, a smart thing to do, is I did a lot of research about migrant housing. And, um, you know, for some reason we have a very, um, we have an attitude that we know everything. If I come to one of your studios and I say, okay, today we're going to start designing migrant housing, you all will go right to your desk and start de designing migrant housing as if you knew anything about migrants or the housing they needed. And that's, that's a real problem in our, in our education and actually it was one of the reasons I didn't like working for Stephen Hall because he would basically the clients, he, he actually said this, um, I agreed to do this house because the client promised not to interfere in the design. And I, you know, somehow I thought, you know, something's going wrong here. If I was a doctor and I said, you know, come into my office and I'll do whatever operation I want, I don't care what's wrong with you, you know, I probably wouldn't get that many patients. And I, I, I kind of think that's why only 2% of the population really does come to us. So, so the first thing I did when I moved to central Pennsylvania was do, do some research on migrant housing. And uh, do you guys know the uh, movie Train Spotting that has the worst bathroom in Scotland? Well, well this is the worst bathroom in the, in the US. Not only is it a uh, outhouse, but it's a triple holer. And the whole thing was painted uh, dark green. By the way, out, outhouses meet code for farm worker housing. Um, let me say a few other things about farm workers. They earn $14,000 a year. When they passed the minimum wage protection laws, farm workers were e exempted from that. When they passed overtime laws, farm workers were not included in that. There are a lot of child labor laws where farm workers are not included. 50% uh, of farm workers face hunger at some point during the year. So this was, this was uh, a population, first of all, they were very interesting to me because it's very um, diverse. And I loved working with people from Haiti and Jamaica and Mexico. As a designer, it was really fascinating. But it was also uh, a group that worked extremely hard. Um, it's very hard work, very low paid. 
Um, so it was, it was it, to me, there actually there's something very heroic about about their um, survival every day. So it, to me, it was a good cause, and that was almost 20 years ago. So I've maintained <laughs> I've maintained my my passion to serve this particular sector. Um, but what I did at first was to look at the different types of housing, do some typology studies. It's a typology that just started after World War II, so I really didn't have to, you know, go back too far. Um, but basically learn what worked and what didn't work. Uh, pretty much found out that the, uh, this is one type call, I call the hotel type, type um, sort of a horse, some, some of the farm workers call it a horse stall. Um, the worst type, though, is called a bullpen, which is basically a big room like this where they can put about 300 guys. Farm workers get 50 square feet per person in the code. So, you know, you can have eight guys living in 400 square feet. It's, it's pretty minimal. And when you put that many in a big room like this, it's really uh, causes a lot of tension. And uh, there are fights. And, and what I say to farmers is, you know, if that's the type of housing you build, I'm not, if I'm with 99 other guys, I'm not going to go in and clean the bathroom. But if I'm living with like four or five friends, you know, we say to each other, hey, it's your turn, go clean the bathroom. So one of the, <clears throat> one of the arguments we use with farmers to build um, smaller units of housing is uh, that it will be better maintained and people will take better responsibility for it. Uh, what I found was that um, there's actually federal funding that pays for this type of housing. So after I left Stephen Hall's office, I went to work for a nonprofit for five years and basically learned how nonprofits produce housing. And that's pretty much what I do now, except that nonprofits don't value design in the way that I do. So I am a nonprofit design firm, a nonprofit that has design, quality design in our mission. So we apply for all the federal grants that all the housing authorities do. I didn't make this all up. People make money at it, make a living at it. Um, <clears throat> but we've just uh, tweaked it by adding you know, our, our desire to make everything the best design quality we can. This actually, the, the programs I used were started in 1935. Uh, they funded Dorothea Lang to actually go out and take these photographs um, to get these programs started. They were first called Resettlement Administration. Farm Security Administration, now they're called Rural Development. So just some, going through some of my own work, you know, I love the vernacular. Um, so the first unit we designed was for single males. It's for five guys. What we found was that the single males like to come and leave and go back. The families want to be, want to stay. So when we designed for the single males, we kind of expressed that um, mobility, which was a uh, something they liked. They, didn't, they don't want to stay. They just wanted to come and have the economic opportunity and then go back home. So hopefully you can see that sort of mobility metaphor. These were in central Pennsylvania. Um, we have AmeriCorps fellows come and work with us. This is Kendra Welsh from Rice University. I know she looks like she's sort of a model or something, but she's a very tough, she can grind steel better than anybody I know. So. Uh, the fellows come and work with us and um, uh, help on all these projects. Uh, we have about uh, eight of those every year in different places. Basically, they get their own project. I mean, they're, you know, they're on their own. I say, you guys have been in, the, you've been in training for years in school. Now you're in the game. They're not my assistant. They get their own project. Um, one of the other types of early farm worker housing that I thought was kind of a positive image were these little motel style cottages. People just hauled them onto the farm because the need, the need happened for interstate workers right after World War II and nobody had housing for them. So you had to provide housing. So this is some uh, migrant housing we did in, whoops, migrant housing we did in rural Virginia. Actually, the interesting thing about this housing is that there was a, a water crisis in the community and a sewer crisis shortage. So what we proposed was that the workers lived here and the gray water came and um, watered the crops. Um, it was an organic farm, so there was no pesticides, but, so you could put it, the crop near the housing. Anyway, so 
the workers also got a kind of nice greenhouse attached to their, to their unit. Um, we also were invited by Florida Legal Services. I used to say that the people I work for never call me. I have to go out and find them. That's actually not the case anymore. Um, we're getting calls all the time now. And uh, a, a, a really nice project we were invited to do was in uh, 2004, um, there were two hurricanes in Florida, this is the year before Katrina, that wiped out a lot of the migrant housing, and that's what you see here. This is migrant housing that wasn't damaged by the hurricane, so you can see even without the damage, it's not, this wasn't damaged either. Um, but Florida Legal Services were, said, we're getting some uh, emergency funding to replace the housing. Can you come? To I woke you up. Can you come to Florida and uh, design something that's better than a FEMA unit? So this is our unit. Um, we have it priced at $42,000. It's you know very high quality. It's 26 gauge galvanized. Oops. Um, we sell these uh, directly to farmers, and we actually add $5,000 to it and sell them for $47,000. We sold eight about two months ago. We're probably going to sell 20 in the next month. So if you wonder about how we make money, it's by um, being creative. We don't charge anybody a design fee, but we've included our costs uh, in the cost of the unit. Um, this is a project we're doing with a um, migrant church to address uh, hunger. You wouldn't think that hunger was necessarily something architects could solve, but as I said, 50% of migrants have uh, um, it's called food insecurity in the federal uh, jargon um, sometime during the year. But what we proposed here was a community garden and then a market uh, with actually with a green roof so that the produce, people could grow their produce and consume it themselves but also sell extra produce. The reason it's at the church is because most migrants don't have transportation but they can get to the church once a week. So while they're at the church, they're also there to work on their garden and sell their produce. So if you propose something without realizing that migrants don't have transportation, you might end up with an empty building. Um, we're doing another project for a blueberry farmer. Blueberries are, are doing very well. All the tobacco is kind of slowing down in North Carolina. And uh, blueberry is now the new crop. So. Um, a lot of these guys don't have housing, so this is a unit for eight guys that we've just designed. And we're working with the state finance agency to get a really good um, funding uh, package for the farmers to build this. Um, I'm going to talk about a few student projects. Um, this was with NC State. Uh, one, of our, one of our fellows said that um, said, Brian, the housing you do is great, but the, it's really the bathrooms that is the worst part. Why don't we just do sort of a surgical strike and replace bathrooms on this housing? So we teamed up with NC State students, and we found this uh, housing here, this farmer's housing. There's no bathroom there. The bathroom is back here. Now, the worst part of this bathroom is there's no natural light or ventilation, which is free, right? But I mean, it's, it's a bad bathroom, but it's dark and uh, moldy. Um, so what we did was, uh, how, do we, how do we get the feedback? You know, I talked about just going to your desk and designing something when you don't have any knowledge. What we do is we actually go to uh, flea markets on Sunday afternoons where the farm workers already are. And we set up a booth and we start asking questions. And if they, if they answer our questions, we give them something. I mean, because we like to think we're helping them, but at that point, they're actually helping us. We're not helping them at that point. So um, it actually is very popular for whatever reason. I think just that it's very boring to be a farm worker, probably. But we usually have a crowd gather 
And so, you know, here's Heather Payton trying to ask, remember her high school Spanish and say something like, how much privacy do you want in the shower or something like that. It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of challenging. But, you know, one of the things that students don't get while they're in school is the opportunity to communicate with a client and learn how to get that. Um, you know, it's a critical part of, of being an architect. And I don't know why we're, we're taught how to talk very well. We're not taught how to listen very well or what, really what questions to ask people. So I think it's a really good part of their education to get out there and have to, have to try and find, basically find the poetry, you know, in whatever your project is, even if it's a bathroom. You're looking for something poetic. So here's the new bathroom. And I can assure you that there's a lot of light and ventilation in this project. Uh, this roof is actually made from salvaged cotton barrels. Um, it's the kind of thing, I'm sure you experience this in your design build pro projects, where you can build a nice half inch model and say, I'm going to cut barrels in half and make a roof out of it. It's very easy to do at that scale. Once you start mocking it up, uh, you realize, well, this barrel doesn't have parallel sides. You know, it's a detailing mess. It usually takes us about three times. I actually call it design, build, design, build, design, build. Right, Sean? So this, took, this was the third time we did it. And so we, we were using other barrels, and somebody said, you know, there are all these cotton barrels. They come in any diameter, any color you want. And, and there are thousands of them because nobody uses them anymore. So once we figured out the detail, we basically attached all these on the ground, and we could put the roof up in about an hour. So you get the detail right. And that's, that's, the, that's the joy of design build. Uh, and that's when we bring materials in to uh, help solve some of these issues. Um, we actually didn't steal these signs, but for some reason they consider a lot of these signs um, you know, trash when they're in really good shape, and the Department of Transportation gave them to us. Some of it's from habitat reuse. You know, the students welded this stand. Anyway, um, we do have a summer program that uh, students come to, and basically what we teach is uh, what I call asset-based design. And just in a, a quick uh, summary of what asset-based design is. Um, when I went to teach at the Rural Studio, uh, when Sambo Mockby got sick, he asked me to come and, and uh, teach at the Rural Studio. And I had never taught before, and I said, Sambo, how do you guys do this work? And he said, basically, we beat the bushes until the good ideas come up, and then we grab them. Okay. So a good design idea is an asset, and that's something we can generate you know, endlessly. And you're, you're, you don't have to have money to do it. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing we can contribute. Um, so what we do in our summer studio, a lot of people have not had a, an opportunity to collaborate. I can tell you that none of those rural studio projects would be that good if it was only one designer. They're only that good, and they're only built because it's a collaboration. You take everybody's good idea and you put them together, you get something much better than any one of those designers. So that's a little insight to the real studio. So that's what we try and do in our, in our um, summer studio. This was a bus shelter we built in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, we're always trying to maximize the impact. They, they said, um, you know, the Department of Transportation gave us $10,000, but went to the community and said, what, what can, where do you want this to go? And uh, what else can it be? And they said, well, we'd like a landmark because nobody really knows where our community is. We'd also like a gateway to our park. This is in the center of their community. And we'd also like a bus shelter. So you know, we're trying to make it more than a bus shelter. Um, one interesting story about this is that uh, we had actually proposed another location, which was up on the hill. You know, All architects want everybody to see their projects. So. We put it up on the hill. And, and uh, the, we were working with these matriarchs of the community. And they said, that's fine. And then this policeman showed up about halfway through our process and said, you can't put it there. The drug dealers will take it over. And 
Let me first explain that the drug dealers in this community are about three guys that everybody knows and they all went to school with them, so it's not like, you know. So the, the matriarchs were pretty um, confounded by this uh, sort of veto that the policemen. But um, some of our students went and talked to the drug dealers and they said, hey, if we put this bus shelter there, are you guys going to take it over? And they said, yeah. And uh, they said, well, what about this other location down by the stream there? And they said, no, we won't go down there. So, you know, uh, you know the, the cop was like, he's like, you did what? You talked to them? But anyway, they, they really solved the, you know. Um, and it's a beautiful location. Shiloh means resting place, and it's down by the stream. So it was really a Again, it's sort of this process of putting everybody's ideas together. Oh, here's another case. Okay, here's, so we wanted to, we got this Aluka bond, beautiful aluminum material donated, and we wanted to have this, you know, have it look like a paper roof. And when we're detailing how it goes together, these are our first three clunky ideas, okay? And there you see the final idea. So, again, it's easy to build this out of paper in a model. It's not that easy to actually make it look like that, so. They're the matriarchs that uh, kind of were our uh, leaders. Uh, the next year we went back and we went into a rougher neighborhood and the policeman said the same thing and we said, gee, um, didn't you say that last year? And they said, yeah. And we said, well, did the drug dealers take it over yet? No, they haven't. So we said, well, you know, we're not going to buy that this year either. And the reason we found that um, you know, getting the community involved in the process, they, this becomes their bus shelter, and they, they care about it, and they protect it. Um, you can't see everything, but a lot of this was done. There's these clay tiles down here done by the children. Um, it's actually right by an art center, and the uh, city was trying to have this neighborhood be the art community. And um, so it was appropriate as a kind of a symbol for what the... Uh, city had planned for that community center. Most of it's salvage material, all that aluminum is salvage. We, one of our projects is to go to the go to the dump and find some salvage material to build with. Um, and uh, it's you know amazing variety of things of rich materials you can find there. Uh, this aluminum would have cost a fortune if we had, you know, specked it out, but we just happened to find it. Benches. So now I'm going to talk about um, a project at the Rural Studio, and I want to illustrate this asset-based design I'm talking about. If, do you all remember the story of Stone Soup um, when you are a little kid? Well, I have a, I have a three-year-old, so let me run through it. Basically, this, this guy is going into town, and he's doesn't have any money, but he finds a stone. And he goes into the town and says, I'm going to make stone soup. And so everybody kind of gathers around, and he says, um, uh, somebody says, um, well, I'll lend you a pot, because, you know, give it back, but I'll lend it to you for a little while. And somebody else said, well, I'll give you some water. And then somebody says, well, I have some extra carrots. And somebody says, well, I'll get some, you know, I'll, I'll throw in some salt. So everybody throws in a little bit until they end up with this delicious gumbo that feeds the whole town. Um, that's kind of our approach to design when we go into a community. I mean, we, we go in there with that stone and we sort of want to start something, but we have to kind of get the ideas and the assets from the other people to know where we're going to end up. Um, and no matter how poor a community is, no matter how... Um, how depressed it is, um, they have some assets. That last project that I showed you, um, when we went into this community and said, what, what do you all like about your neighborhood? They, they were stone silent, didn't say a thing. But when we watched them at this intersection, um, if somebody was waiting for the bus, somebody would always pick them up and take them into town. And they would stop their cars in the middle of that intersection and talk to each other. I mean, they had an amazing sense of community. Um, but they didn't, they didn't see that. You know? they, didn't understand, they didn't see that as an asset. So uh, working in these, these small Alabama um, communities, 
Um, again, you're looking for what is that poetry, what is that aspect? Sorry. I'm doing wrong. What is that asset that the community has that you want to celebrate? Um, you know, in the South, they deal with poverty by hiding it. And, you know, there's these dirt roads that go really nowhere. And um, even the, even the uh, secretary at the rural studio thought that we were making up the data on poverty there because she basically had no reason to ever drive down these dirt roads and see where the lowest income people lived. Um, but at the same time, there's something beautiful about those roads in Alabama. And um, so I was a thesis advisor for some guys, and, and they said, you know, this little town of Mason's Bend, we've done some single family houses, but we haven't done any community or public buildings here. And um, let's do something for everybody. Well, the rural studio had done houses for two families, and there was a third family. There are basically three families in this, in this community, about 30 houses. And uh, the third family was getting pretty antagonistic. Um, and we, we were trying to get everybody involved in our community project, <clears throat> and um, they wouldn't talk to us. So I said, well, let's go to every single house and knock on the door and just be friendly and say, you know, is there something that we can do? Is there some project that would benefit you? So one of the students went to one of the, this, this is the, the third family is, is named Field. And she went, he went to one of the Field family's houses, knocked on the door, and said, you know, hi, I'm Heath Van Fleet. I'm with the Rural Studio. Is there something I can do for you? And she said, yeah, you can cut the weeds in my backyard. And uh, he said, well, OK. You know, he's like, that wasn't what I was really thinking. But so Heath goes to the backyard and starts cutting the weeds. And then her son-in-law comes back there and starts cutting the weeds with him. And they become good friends. And then through their friendship, we're able to work with the Field family. And the lesson I learned there is that sometimes you have to put your own agenda aside and help somebody out from purely from their point of view to really establish a trusting relationship to be a good designer. Um, so when we went on to do the project, um, whoops, the, uh, we said, well, there's this old school bus abandoned on this, this. We found this triangular site, which was kind of in between all three families. It, uh, it's where the, everybody got their mail. It's also where the school bus picked up the kids. So we're like, well, this has a sort of public aspect to it already. Um, and there was this empty school bus there. So we said, great, we'll cut that up, we'll salvage it, we'll reuse it. It'll be a metaphor of, of education and rebirth. Fortunately, at that point, we asked the community what they thought about that idea. And they said, that's a terrible idea. They said, somebody sold drugs in that place, there's snakes in that place, every kind of archetypal evil you, know, you can imagine in a rural community they associated with this bus. So we said, OK, well, that's, that's not the way we'll do it. And, and, you know, architects can kind of head off in the wrong direction. And if you don't get a little uh, feedback or reality check sometimes, you'll, you'll do something that really has the wrong result. But uh, this was actually like one of the few little public areas. They had some outdoor benches people sat on. Uh, they actually have a Frank Gehry doghouse. Um, so what we decided to do was to take that beautiful earth and make the building out of it. And again, that three times of failure, this was all our failures where we practiced. They also had originally proposed a 16-foot tall building. Once you get about four feet high with rammed earth and you're lifting it up and putting it down, you realize you, you, know, you really want to be careful about building anything 16 feet high. So, but you can, you, know, you can see each time you, you do a... a a packing, you know, if the earth changes color. So again, you know, it, it's, it's, it's design, build, design, build. Um, I just want to show some of the study models in the, in the Rural Studio does. This is about getting the ideas out quickly and then grabbing those good ideas. It's, it's not about the making one idea and then defending it for the rest of the semester which is what I did in school. So these are just you know, ideas all over the place. Each time you're trying to find one thing, you, like, you find the one good idea, 
you keep that and you jettison the rest. So you can see they were all over the place. So here's finally our working model. Um, we, didn't, we never did any working drawings, just this working model. There's the better version of the rammed earth. And one little uh, vestige of that bus, we got some windows from a junkyard in Chicago. Actually, one of the guys was from Chicago. And one day a month, anything you pushed out of there was $100. So he got some Caprice Classic windows and brought them down. He said he bottomed out his Toyota the whole way down to Alabama. So there's the community building in Mason's Bend. And one of the great things about it was when we had this uh, ground uh, opening, you know, everybody came out there. And like I said, a lot of people who hadn't been out to a community like that and seen that poverty, you know, came out. And um, it wasn't really about this building. It was that they, they saw some of the critical social issues that uh, nobody was addressing. So. Um, I was at a conference recently and somebody said, you know, designers need something like a bat signal that the community can so send up into the air and say, we need a designer. So uh, we like that idea. So I'm working with a group now and um, you all know what LEED is, right? Uh, the environmental metric. Well, this is SEED. This is Social Economic Environmental Design. So we're taking the success of LEED and we're, how can we apply social and economic issues? I mean, the, the environment is a critical issue, but there are a lot of communities facing other issues, um, such as health and hunger. Um, so we need to um, not just look at the environmental side of things, but also, and what we're working on now is having some kind of metric where people could say, you know, how, how am I doing? And then be able to, to communicate with the community. This is what we're going to do. This is how well we did. Because right now there's a lot of kind of bullshitting that goes on and a lot of promises that happen and then aren't fulfilled. So we need a better communication tool for designers to sit down with the community and make these things happen. Now, if you go to that network, you're going you're gonna to see that this thing is just hatching. I mean, you're, this is not a done deal yet. But I think it's going to be very important in a couple of years. Hopefully, you'll find it useful uh, if and when you do a community-based project. So I'm just going to end with a few, few comments about uh, Hurricane Katrina and that, uh, that effort. We've done some projects down there now. And um, uh, you know, one of the things that first uh, struck me, 50, 50,000 houses are being demolished and going right to landfills. And the landfills are a big problem. Um, they're taking up a huge amount of space. But if you could save just 5% of that, of those houses, that's 53 million board feet of wood. And it could build almost 4,000 houses. Um, so we've been working with the Green Project, trying to salvage some of their material. Um, this is a table. And this isn't just wood. This is 150 year old, some of it's 150 year old virgin cypress that you can't buy. Um, beautiful material that's going into landfills. Um, so some University of Texas students with Sergio Palleroni designed this table. Uh, a little interesting story about why this was designed. Uh, Oprah was building 100 houses in Houston for New Orleans evacuees. And, she said to them, Was there, what, what, can we do, build something for you, um, like furniture? And they said, yeah, we want something. We want some actual material from New Orleans, and we want something to do with eating. And I'm like, that's new, I'm from New Orleans. So I'm like, that's New Orleans. That's all about eating down there. So uh, anyway, it's a beautiful table. Another, another product they did, um, hundreds of churches lost their pews, and they don't have the money to to uh, buy new pews. So another project was to use the cypress and actually a little new plywood uh, for, for a pew for these churches. Um, last summer we did a, uh, we worked on the Gulf Coast, our, our design build summer studio. And uh, this was our client. His name was Billy Ray Rains. And it's, it's funny because Billy Ray is a little like Alice. At one point he said, we had all these meetings with him. 
And we were going to build, uh, there was a group called Building Goodness that was that building rooms for people living in FEMA trailers. Um, families have been in FEMA trailers for two years, and it's a one bedroom, one bath situation, and it's like very um, tense, you know, for a family to be. So they're building these extra rooms for people to have, you know, it's, it can be an outside living room or a playroom or a storage room. Um, what we did was we went down and proposed building those not out of T111 from Lowe's, but to build it out of salvage material. So Billy was our first client. He was, you know, we didn't want to work with children in our prototype because we thought some of it might be a little rough. We didn't want to injure anybody. Um, Billy is a volunteer coordinator there, so we thought it'd be good for him to, you know, if, if we could get him to buy into this concept, he would promote it for other people to do in their, in their volunteer projects. But what Billy said to us, at, sort of in the middle of all our meetings with him, he said, I just want a shed, guys, you know, just give me a shed. Um, but, uh, you know, again, getting to know Billy, he loves fishing, so here's his... Here's the final result, and Billy would never say again, I just want to shed, because every, every square inch of this is something about, something about Billy. There's where he cleans his fish. There's his workbench back there where he can work on his new house. Um, we have a light shelf to the north, um, but all salvage material. It was structurally... We, to, we wanted it to be movable so he could move it if he had to, but the students wanted to have a post and beam structure so they could have infill panels. So it's pretty hard to have a, we had to, it was a nice challenge. We actually ended up with kind of a Japanese joint, a moment joint at the top and bottom of the columns. Um, you know, it's hard to have a post and beam that doesn't go into the ground, so. But we did, we figured it out. Um, two last student projects that, uh, I just want to say, you know, when, when these students were really superheroes for me because these two projects were, the, the architecture students were the first, first people to build anything new in the seventh ward of New Orleans and the ninth ward of New Orleans. And I can tell you how significant it was then to have anything new built because this, these were the areas in New Orleans people were saying, uh, we're not going to go back there. But it was people's homes in their communities. So even the sound of a hammer um, in those communities was, uh, had a high impact. Uh, this was uh, Kansas State. And um, uh, this was a little um, community garden where people were kind of collecting to. And they milled this at uh, school and um, brought it down and set it up. And there it is set up at school. So they actually built it at school, just disassembled it, took it down, and set it up on a weekend. They had a big party for him. Big Seven is, uh, means the Seventh Ward. This is one of the Mardi Gras sort of uh, clubs. So just an ending. Um, this, doesn't, this can be very simple, OK? I, sometimes when I speak like this, I actually have more than like an hour. And I have like three days. And I will give an assignment, a design-build assignment. And how long do you think it takes to find a project, program the project, find the materials, build the project? The record uh, so far is 24 hours. Okay, So you shouldn't feel like, well, I don't have $25,000 to build a community center. You don't have to. Um, uh, just This was a project in Barcelona. This woman um, commutes on the... Uh, every morning on the metro, and she realized there was an area on the metro where people weren't standing because there was nowhere to hold on to the... Um, so she, she installed that. She put a little sign up that says, hold on tight, this is my contribution to the city. Um, you know, it was three in the morning, she was going to do it, make it in red, and she couldn't find red, and so she did it in black, which kind of caused some confusion. She's actually, let's see, she's actually sitting here. There she is right there. I mean, they don't know that's who put it in there. She's just listening to what they said. It's a little bit like heavy trash. Um, but anyway, the black sort of people thought it was some kind of memorial or something. So it was a little, a little confusing. But, you know, it was a great, uh, she, found, she found something needed and she implemented something. Um, this was an, another one. Um, this is in Oklahoma. 
Uh, you know, this is, this is a path that the architecture students walk on every single day. And across the street, you have to push a button right here. And there was always a mud puddle right here, you know? So when I proposed, the pro when I proposed that assignment of help somebody, um, whoops. Well, I won't go back to it. But, you know, the guy immediately figured out, I'll just, put, I'll just make some plates and put it in the mud so that nobody has to step in the mud anymore. It's that simple. And what I love to, I'm ending on this slide, but what I uh, love to think about this is if these students did this every year at their university, you know, everybody else would start to say, there are those architecture students helping people out again. You know, it, it wouldn't be a bad uh, change in our reputation. So, in conclusion, the 98 percent is not a monolithic group. It will take careful consideration of individuals to solve individual needs. From this view, the opportunities in architecture are almost unlimited and the potential for our profession is truly exciting. I think a critical mass of work has been completed to demonstrate what is possible. I was taught that good design ideas come from intuitive inspiration within us. But what I've learned is that the best design ideas come from understanding what is outside of us as well. That inspiration can come from the people we serve. Society evolves, and let us hope that in this change is the improvement of conditions for all, not just the few. Designers can play a critical role as we reshape our future. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, we'll open the floor up for questions. We always need an icebreaker. Oh, we like to look at these images from down south and say, oh man, poverty down there is just so intense. And uh, boy, if we had more that, like that around here, maybe we could do more, but we do. We have some challenges right here in this area, but we're so busy ignoring it or avoiding it or building new communities to get away from it that we just don't uh, even know it exists. Got challenges, yes, sir. You've, you've certainly done a number of projects all over the country, and uh, I guess my question for you would be, while you're doing those projects in each of these remote locations, where, where is it that you are working? What is your, your home base? We're out of Raleigh, and my own work is, uh, is working with migrants. Um, but as I said, we have eight fellows that come work with us every year. They're everywhere from, they're on the Gulf Coast, Tulane, Alabama, two in North Carolina, one's going to be in L.A. Um, let's see, where else? Um, so basically, a community will come with an issue. Uh, some worked on that child care center or the job training center. Um, and we just put them out there and say, OK, here's what the community needs. You're a designer. You know, meet each other. You know, get it done. And uh, it's, it's phenomenal what, um, what they're doing. Um, so uh, it typically is small communities, although the, 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 it's actually Santa Barbara. It's an amazing situation. I mean, there are a million architects there. But what you have is you have the university, you have landlords that make a lot of money off the students, and you have the faculty and staff that can't afford to live there anymore. Well, the landlords have all kinds of architects in their pockets. The university has all these fancy you know, firms they hire. There's nobody to design anything physical form for those faculty and the staff. And these are brilliant faculty. They have an art department. They just have no, it's like their hands are tied. They know what they want. They can describe it to you. But nobody can draw it up or design it for them. So um, it's not necessarily we always go into a rural community. Certainly Biloxi and New Orleans aren't, uh, aren't rural communities. This summer, we're going to be designing a streetscape in New Orleans. Uh, Ferret Street's a wonderful old community commercial strip. It's all empty right now, but they're trying to revitalize it. They've started a, a farmer's market there that's really active. And uh, um, we think we're going to work with the uh, Tulane glass, glass blowing workshop, maybe have our kind of motif be glass. And, uh, who knows? So um, did that answer your question? So it's, um, it's really any community. You can take the same process into any community. 
we like to go where there's no other architects because, I mean, frankly, if, if there's another architect competing for a job, I'm like, you're sure, so I'll go find, you know, I feel, I'll feel more meaningful if there's nobody else there. So I, I never compete, I never do competitions or anything like that because it's just like, I mean, you go out and make up your own competition and hey, you win. <laughs> it's your project. Yeah. Um, Brian, I have a, a general question. And this is something that I've kind of always thought about relative to the rural studio especially. And I've had kind of discussions about this with, with others. Um, and that is the idea that um, the ethical based work that the rural studio does for these, you know, for these communities. And it's, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering from a standpoint of, you know, designing for these people in the way that you, that the rural studio does, stylistically, um, in, a, in a sort of experimental mode, I think to an extreme in some cases. Um, and it's not that I'm necessarily against it, but I'm just curious about like the reaction of some of the people that you serve in designing in this way with, with, uh, with the forms that are created out of throwaway materials and, you know, just, if you could just kind of speak to that. Sure. Uh, and, and like what is, you know, I, I read some of the books and I see some of the, the, your clients posing in these spaces and I can't help but think that they may be a little uncomfortable by that. And, uh, and, and know, they're in a position to accept anything that's kind of designed for them, I suppose, because I guess some of them are in a pretty desperate state. But just to speak to that, if you could. Absolutely. Um, it's a good question. It's a valid question. This, if, I'm, if I'm acting like I know all the answers, believe me, uh, I don't mean to. I, I, um, you know, frankly, when Sambo started doing these houses, he was a very intuitive person, a very people person, and he would always look for the poetry in people, but then he would internalize it, and he, some intuitive design response would pop out. That's not, I, I have a problem with that, you know. There's not, that's not a real communication. Um, I will say that however they've gotten to this point, the, the rural studio is, you know, a huge asset for that community now. And they are, they're, I, won't, I can't say they're all behind it, frankly. There's some people in that community that say, we live here, and I'm talking about the, like the lawyer downtown who I went to Princeton with his nephew. I mean, I'm, talk I'm not talking about the low-income types. Um, who said, I live here because I don't want any change. I don't want progress. Well, that's fine if you're a lawyer on Main Street, but you know. So is there some problem with certain people that like it the way it was? Yes. Um, but the people that we're trying to serve, how do they respond to it? I don't, I don't agree with when, when they don't know what they're going to get. I always think, you know, that's not the best process. So yes. It, it, it's a it's a it's a good and valid criticism of the early work. Now, there's a much. When we did that child care, I mean the job training center, it's not radical, but they said to us, we want something that looks new. That community, Marion, is extremely proud of their antebellum past. You would think that they would want you know an antebellum job training center. They said we want something that looks contemporary. We want to show that we're you know out of the I mean, you know, they're, they're trying desperately not to miss the whole digital age, you know. So um, I think for now that whole, the, it's, it's a positive thing for that community in terms of branding it and, and generating, um, you know, enthusiasm and progress. Um, but I first worked with Sambo on houses, uh, we did some houses in 1988. It was like the some of the very first housing, low-income housing he designed. And I, I can tell you, we, we didn't, we just kind of went in and came back and proposed. Now, we didn't know we were going to get funding, so we couldn't quite promise anything, and we didn't get funding. So, um, but, you know, what I like to say is, you may see one good idea up here, you may see a lot of bad ideas, take that good idea, okay? Don't take the bad ideas. And I'm not saying everything up here is a good idea. Uh, you know, and if you, if you can actually apply that principle to this, and you all, you know, and what you all need to do, I mean, my generation is like, forget it. We haven't, like, given you much to go with. But don't look at anything like this and say, that's, 
you know, all I can do is imitate that. You've got to do a lot better than this. I mean, you should be able to do a lot better than this. Hopefully you've gotten some ideas out of this. But, you know, our generation has just barely, you know, started anything at all. But hopefully, hopefully you realize what's possible. That's the main thing. And that you can go a lot further. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Sometimes the best design direction is when you're off the design script. Yeah, that's the way I'd say it. And that's why, you know, that face to face is always. That's sort of, a, I mean, you know, that's what, you know, Stephen Hall and a lot of clients, think, a lot of students think the client is the enemy. We're kind of taught that. And uh, what Sambo taught me was that, the, you know, the inspiration can really come from the client. And you've got to, but you've got to believe it's in there and you've got to keep looking for it. Because otherwise you're going to get, you know, possibly really boring stuff. You know, you really want to keep looking for it. And then you kind of, then you put it together with the material and the detailing. Um, and you can't design everything. No designer gets, almost no designers get to design everything. You've got to make that special moment. And that special moment has to do with that special uh, aspect of that person or that community. Any other questions? Uh, yes, I was just wondering um, what techniques have you used or maybe implemented uh, to get around, um, I know in South Florida especially, um, the uh, insurance standards and premiums have gone up uh, tenfold after these recent disasters. Um, how do you um, coincide with the, those, those companies and, and that kind of uh, red tape uh, when you're doing these projects? Well, we certainly, d I mean, the Rural Studio doesn't have any code enforcement. But for South Florida, that, that will withstand 130 mile an hour wind. I mean, that doesn't get around anything. That's a tough building that meets code. Um, it's 800 square feet. And the, the first guy that built it put four people in there. So that's 200 square feet per person. So we're actually doing four times the minimum code for square footage. Um, you know, the code in that project is critical. It was all about surviving the next hurricane with this housing. Sometimes, you know, code's a little less critical. And um, um, we would take a little more of a, a heavy trash approach, you know. Um, especially when we have 24 hours, you don't get any permits, you know, in 24 hours. So did I answer your question at all or? Okay. So it's, you know, code plays a varying role. It really depends on where we, where we find it. Um, I mean, where, where, how important it is for that project. But, but generally, I mean, most, most meet code. Sometimes we exceed it. Yeah. Well, you just all I can say is you're lucky that you're coming out now. I mean, you know, it used to be <clears throat> you couldn't. You tried to say I'm custom designing low-income housing. People were just like, no, 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 no. You don't no, understand. Design is, you know. Now I'd say it to anybody, and they don't think I'm crazy. They say, oh, okay, yeah, like you know, like a guy in Alabama or whatever. But they, it's it really. This whole change I'm talking about, a lot of it has to do with the public's perception of us. And I don't know exactly how that changed, but they're a lot more receptive to, to us being involved in oh, sorry. in the process. Um, but the best way to get involved is to pick an issue, essentially, and find out <clears throat> what non-designers are working in that issue, 
okay, and learn from them. And then, oh, well, you know, at some point along the way, an idea is going to pop into your head that's a design idea. And you'll say, did you guys ever think about this? And they'll say, no. And you'll say, well, can I do some sketches for you? And, you know, all of a sudden, and that's why you have to do your homework first. If you kind of knock on the door and hand them a sketch, that project's going nowhere. So it takes a little bit of homework, but, you know, pick an issue that you're passionate about. And believe me, 20 years ago, I thought I was going to do a couple of migrant, you know, houses and move on. But I just, it's really meaningful to me. I mean, I have, I do, I pick the clients I want in the world. That's pretty lucky as a designer to do that, you know. Um, even Stephen Hall didn't get to do that. So um, that's, that's the way I'd approach it. And, you know, if you're in a traditional firm, you're learning, tool, you're learning skills and tools. Uh, Frank Gehry actually said something uh, intelligent, and I'll repeat it to you. He said that um, when he started his career, he had to do what he wanted to do after work. And slowly he started integrating that, you know, a little bit more, nine to five. And now he wants to do, now he gets to do what he wants all the time, you know, nine to five, or whatever he works. So that's a way for you to think about this. <clears throat> you know, you don't have to start out by doing this work 40 hours a week. You do it on weekends, you can kind of, you know, find, like people who work for, uh, I can tell you, Going somewhere where there are no other designers is a good idea. People who go to Habitat, to me, that's just banging your head against the wall because they, they're not very open to designers. You go somewhere where there's nobody putting design ideas on the table, and you bring in expertise that they don't have, and my bet is there's something they will need from you. So. Don't look at it as like your first job. I mean, you know, we offer some first jobs. I actually hired a woman. She had three offers. I was competing with Dan Patera and David Perks. I mean, she had three great community offers, which is incredible to me, that, you know, because there were no opportunities when I graduated. But even if you don't pick one of these full-time jobs like we have or other people have, a few other people have, um, you know, you can do it slowly on weekends and in the evenings at first, and then start to build your career that way. Did that answer your question? It really is like writing your own competition and then, you know, I mean, it really is. Um, that's what it's like. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Wow. Awesome. Yes. Sorry. Thanks, Olin. Uh, uh, Brian, maybe uh, two questions, and maybe it's one eventually. I'm not sure. But um, uh, so Olin and I and some students went to Mason's Bend in mid-December, and we saw the community center, and it's in very bad shape now. The windshields are gone. They're gone? They're gone. Oh. Um, there's a lot of weeds growing in the main entryway, and there's a full-size, full really worn mobile home parked between the mailboxes and the community center, wow. about a foot away from the community center building. And, um, and I can't figure out if that's a, a good thing, because maybe the Mason's Bend people have sort of made it their own, and it's not as architecty mm -hmm. as it was when it was finished. And, and, and I'm uh, sort I think of, that's being a little generous. Yeah, I, I, so, that, generous. so that's the first question. <clears throat> Second question maybe is connected to it, which is, um, um, how do we, um, you sort of challenged us to not take the, you know, there's good work. You're, you're doing great work. I, I just want to say that at the, at the very beginning. It's so great that you're here to talk to us and show us, share this work with us. It's so inspiring. How do we know uh, uh, if work is good or bad in, in this realm that you're working in, Olin's working in, Sean's working in, I'm kicking around in it as well. What's the sort of critical framework to lay on this? Because as Paul was saying, I think, we feel really good about the work, but it's almost impossible to evaluate it critically. And if you do, holy cow, do people come after you if you start asking some questions about this kind of work? Well, I, I agree with everything you said except that last comment. Um, 
I mean, I, I don't know who's coming after you, but I think that's the next step we have to take. That's what the seed is about. Um, we need to be able to prove to communities that we did what we said we were going to do. And uh, if, you look at, if you look at something called a Kellogg, Lo Kellogg Foundation logic model, you know, are you familiar with that? Well, you know, foundations use this all the time because people throw out this stuff, we're going to go down and help this community out. And, you know, they give them $100,000 and they never really know what happened. So they've come up with something called a logic model, which I think is going to be um, the way we look at this social, economic, environmental design. And we, we're, we're doing an evaluation metric right now. So it's like, what, do you, what exactly are you proposing to do? How are you going to do it? You know, who else has validated that? How are you going to show intermediate outcomes? So, but let me tell you something. If we figure that out, we're going to kick some ass because then we can, you know, we really have the meat to show what we do. Um, it's, it's just a little, you know, we get, we do get poisoned by the people who do a bad job or, you know, really fail a community or overpromise. Um, but going back to your first point, um, no, there's no doubt that's a failure of that project. And I think um, I would trace it to, I mean, the, the person who owned it, Mr. Anderson, was elderly, and, but he had a great green thumb. He, he let us use the land. I'm, his wife passed away. I, I, he may have passed away by now. So, you know, I mean, there, these things aren't, uh, don't last forever. Um, so I will say that exceeded the assets of that community, and it's failed now. But it did, it did have a, a, a period of time where it served. Um, so I guess um, it's sad to hear that. I, I would love for it to have made a, more of a contribution, but um, you know that my, I don't want to give a community more, um, you know, uh, obligation or hardship than than they're ready, ready to take on. So, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming this evening. There are some refreshments out. Uh, the gumbo, I'm not sure it's ready yet, but there's some pretzels out there and some punch. Huh?